very nice elderly black lady always used to sit to her own window way over there on the other side of the bus. We always rode the bus at the same time, always caught at the same time, always got off at the same place. Never met her, had no idea to this day what her name is. One day I got on the bus and I said, you know what, do you mind if I sit here? So I decided to sit next to her. And here's one of the things that she used to do. She'd look out the window, she'd see some kids playing in one of those little pools. And she'd say, oh, glory be, glory be to God. She'd see uh, some mother with her child waiting at the bus stop. She'd say, oh, glory, glory be. She always would look at something and she'd say, oh, glory, glory be. Now, I never asked her the question, but I always enjoyed just noticing what she was noticing and hearing her say, oh glory, oh glory be. And I thought to myself, much, much later, many years later, I thought about that woman. She said, oh glory, oh glory be. What in the world was she thinking? What was going through her mind when she voiced those words? Oh glory be to God. It's a, I mean, you might think of uh, Knott's Berry Farm. There's got this, uh, the mine, this mine ride, right? You get on a little train and you go through, and there's a guy that's talking about the, the mining and the gold in the mine, and, and then they come around and there's this very huge cavernous pit, and he, and he says, there it is, folks, the glory hole. So I guess if you were a miner, you would think in your mind, this is the spot. This is the spot where all the gold is dug up. It's the glory hole. Value and, and worth. That's one sense of the word. But there's another sense of the word, too. I think there's a little bit of confusion sometimes when we think about the word glory. And in Scripture... There's something called Shekinah glory. Moses experienced the Shekinah glory of God. In fact, the Israelites experienced the glory of God through all their travels. Once they came out of uh, Egypt and they were crossing through the desert, what should have been like what? Two, two to seven weeks for that many people, and it'll be 40 years. But they had that smoke by day and fire by night. They recognized that God was leading them. And then they had the Ark, the Covenant, which had the Ten Commandments in it. They had a ritual system that they followed, a courtyard, and there was a holy. Then inside that, the most holy. And inside the most holy, the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And there, the very presence of God, where the priest would go in there and he would be within the presence of God and witness the glory of God. God has this infrastructure. To, in the Jewish days, it was a ritual system of worship. You give atonement to the priest, you bring in a sacrifice, you burn go through this process. Then Jesus came on the, on the scene and he was the actual fulfillment of that picture. Everything about Christ was about the courtyard, the holy, the holy. In fact, it represented the heart. And that Christ wants to dwell within you. Romans chapter 8, starting with 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, these He also justified. 
and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Oh, glory. Glory be to God. It puts a tremendous amount of value upon it. Recognize. Glorification. He also glorified you. Now, oftentimes we're thinking in terms that God be glorified. Oh, glory. Glory be to God. But here, what Paul is helping us understand is there's this infrastructure that God has put in place. It's a structure that helps us to understand what it is to be glorified with Him. In the New Testament, the term glorification is only used ten times. But it comes from a Hebrew root word revolves around words like holy, hallowed, saints, consecration. Consecration is more than just being set apart, sanctified. It means you belong to God. It means that He's assigned honor. It means that He puts value, glory, glorified with God. Second Corinthians third chapter. Notice how Paul puts it this way, starting with verse 12. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus died. When He died for your sins, He said, you're justified just as though you've never sinned. And therefore, when you look into the mirror, what do you see? Thank God that's a rhetorical question. Because some of us, when we look in the mirror, we're not seeing something so good. Do you see the glory of God when you look into the mirror? Take a look. I remember one brother that came through here, and he came up to me and he said, George, I was looking in the mirror, like you said. I'm not the same guy. I didn't recognize myself. Because it wasn't yourself. It's not yourself you're looking at. You're looking for the image of God. For His glory. It ain't going to look like you. It's not going to look like you. It's something completely different. We're talking about a transformation that when you look into your own eyes in the mirror, you see something completely different than what you saw before. It's a transformed heart. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and starting with verse 20, it says, But in a great house there's not only vessels of gold and silver, oh glory, glory be to God, but also of wood and clay, and some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also your youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach 
patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. There's a process there. If you hear it, you listen carefully. Back it up to verse 19. He says, nonetheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows whose are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Something happens when you receive Christ in your heart. There's a transformation. You begin to see the glory of God. God becomes alive, becomes alive in your life. You begin to recognize that it's not you anymore. Because the old you would have been me first, me first, I, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. Selfish. See, God has called us to be selfless, not selfish. That means we put ourselves on the back burner. Then it's only the glorification of the Lord, Jesus. And then as God is glorified, we are glorified with him. It's a bond of unity. It says it's sealed. There's something uh, called postmodernism. Postmodernism, their view, they have a minimalist view of salvation. It means that, okay, I just go get saved and that's it, I'm done. Back to life as usual. I'm, o I'm okay. Somebody's heard of the Winchester House. That is a postmodern building. The Winchester House is a house that's built for no specific purpose. No purpose whatsoever. There are staircases that go up that lead to nowhere. There are rooms that have, uh, their ceilings are so low, they're completely useless. You can't use it for anything. It's just, it's postmodern. There's no rhyme or reason to why anything is built. But I'll tell you what, that house, like every other house, is built on a foundation. You must have a foundation for the house to stand. A solid foundation means that you know you're sealed of God, that you understand justification, and that you're being glorified with Jesus through sanctification. It's what draws us closer and closer, moving forward in the Lord. From here, you will have established a solid foundation. You know, Jesus even said, to be my disciple, you must hate your mother, hate your father, hate your brother, hate your sister, even yourself. Now, those are strong words, but he wasn't saying hate in the sense of what you know to mean hate, be mad at, and, but he was just saying like less. It means that we put Jesus first and you like God more than anybody else, even yourself. Glorifying God, putting him on top, showing him for who he really is, man, and talking about him as such. And how do you do that? Building a foundation, a foundation in prayer. Learning to pray often and learning what things to pray for. Prayer breaks down into various elements too that we can learn to pray for. And one of those elements is for the glory of God. It's glorifying God. We're learning how to put God first, how to make him a majestic infrastructure in our life that we can build on. And this foundation of prayer is one of the avenues that we use to glorify God. Let me give you a case in point. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 17. And I have several prayers out of scripture that I love to pray from. But you know, there's no reason why you can't find even some of your favorite verses and pray to God with your Bible open from your favorite verses. You will be surprised at what the Lord puts on your heart and how deep your prayer will get, how close you'll be able to connect with God that moment. And there's only one written prayer that we know of in Scripture where you can read Jesus' prayer to God. Now, in Matthew 6, 9, Jesus was instructing the disciples how to pray. He wasn't praying. 
Here in John chapter 17, he is praying. And the words are recorded for us. Listen as I read Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, prayer. Starting with verse 1. Jesus spoke these words. He lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh, and he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory with which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I come forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they're yours. And all mine are yours and yours are mine. And I'm glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those you have given me, that they may become one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you. These things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and your word has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. In them and in you, in me, that they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundations of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, and the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Six times he uses the term glory glorified, and he's talking about you. The first part of the prayer, he's praying for himself, about himself being glorified with the Father. And in the term that he's using here in glorified, he's saying that I can be belonging to you again. 
just as I was belonging to you before the foundations of the world. This prayer is so awesome. I think we need to understand what it is to be glorified by God, what it is to be in God, what the unity is, not just the unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. But now, including yourself in it, 